everybody is always creating from the fourth dimension. Whether you're creating what you want from the fourth dimension or not, that's a different story. Everything that you create begins in an invisible realm. It's coming from a place of imagination. Most of the work is being done the moment you ask. There's this collective spirit that's called infinite intelligence. It's organizing all of humanity to support you in materializing into your life, not necessarily what you want, but what you believe. Your core program is the biggest limiting belief you got from your mom or dad as if it had a baby. Some healers will call the unhealable wound. It neurologically overtakes the system. The good news is it's actually the seed for the next level of your growth. There's only two states of being, powerful states and primal states of being. Everything I wanna create is gonna come from a powerful state. When you start spending less than an hour a day in a primal state, we call that category phenomenon. You're, you're not doubting whether or not it's going to happen. You're allowing it to unfold. And so the beauty is you're getting to enjoy your life. And the irony is, as you're enjoying your life, you're producing even more. The good news is, is it's available to everybody. This mindset thing is a skill. Anybody can create more, especially if it's something that you authentically want to create, not to fill a hole inside of yourself. 100% of the time, consistently and predictably, you'll produce the desired result. And you do that by... When I was 27 years old, that was before I was even aware that I was in my alcoholism, my drug addiction, my pornography addiction at a very deep level. I mean, those things had been going on. I think I got exposed to pornography at 13, probably got exposed to both alcohol and, and drugs. In particular, for me, it was marijuana between 17 and 18 when I went to college. And it's a very confusing time for a young person growing up then. I can only imagine what it's like now because uh, we've been domesticated into this idea of partying but for some of us, the partying was the perfect medication for really early development of trauma. And the fact that we are raised in an educational system that is very mentalized, where we're not, um, we're not trained or taught how to experience our emotions or process our emotions. And so that was a perfect combination for me. And, you know, I was, I was a bright kid. Uh, I was a ruminator, uh, you know, highly intellectual. And, uh, and I developed this idea that I had learned at a very early age that if I could just be successful, then I'd be loved and I'd be okay. And so, you know, now in my early 30s, I had this cocktail of pursuing business success, playing hard, working hard, uh, accumulating um, more unresolved emotional issues. And it finally got to the point when I was in my early 30s at 33 years old that my life had become unmanageable and uh, I had one night where I went out and I blacked out and nothing like that had ever happened to me. I had enough sense to realize, look, this is a problem and I had been trying to stop drinking and drugging and sexing for a long, long time. And uh, fortunately, I had a, a brother who was already in recovery who said, look, you, you, you're, you got a problem. And so I was open to it and I I, you know, it's it's amazing when you look back and you see that there is an intelligent system or structure that is always working to, you know, on one hand, shepherd you towards your dharma, on the other hand, help you process your karma. And, you know, uh, for me, I found this psychologist who specialized in the addicted brain. She understood neuroscience and behavioral psychology, and I had always been a good student. And I started working a 12-step program. It took me about 18 months going to three meetings a week to just start to get a little bit of sobriety under my belt. But I saw that I was changing. And I was also discovering a lot of the limiting beliefs, patterns of thinking uh, that were creating a lot of the undesired cycles of experiences in my life, from toxic relationships to business challenges. And so w once I... Once I had some sobriety, I was like, man, I, I wonder what's possible from here. And I went to the bookstore for literally, I think the first time, as long as I could remember. And I asked the woman at the front desk if there was a section for people who wanted to improve their lives. And she said, yes, it's called, it's called self-help. And I was like, oh, wow, that makes a lot of sense. And I, and I went up to the second floor of a Barnes and Noble and, you know, life leaves you the breadcrumbs. There's a little book on the floor just sitting there waiting for me called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And then that became this bridge between what I had been recovering of my life in my 12-step program and then starting to expand my thinking and really start to re-engineer who David was through personal growth. Yeah, you talk 
you've taken that and really run with it because you go as far as saying that adjusting our um, mental operating system is actually the key to adjusting our, our destiny. So it's not just something that's actually, oh, just change your perspective and you'll feel different about what's actually happening in your life. Actually, downstream from there, everything shifts and evolves. Um, tell us more about that. Well, I, I think most people are confused. They're wanting to create change in their life. They're wanting to attract a relationship or eliminate friction in a relationship or be a better parent or make more money or grow their business or overcome a chronic health challenge. And then we're, we're trying to, to solve these problems without, without even understanding how reality functions. And you know, the brain is a goal achieving machine. Every result we are or are not producing in our life down to the greatest detail is a result of what we think on a moment by moment basis. And so there's, there's a new age spiritual conversation to this, right? The, how we create from the field and quantum mechanics, and we'll, we'll dive into that. But a I think a lot of people sort of think it's a very like vegan thing to say that you create your own reality, you know, <laughs> it's like, no, that's just a fundamental understanding of behavioral psychology. Behavioral psychology tells us we have a distinction we teach. We call it the five primary drivers, but it's a derivative of behavioral psychology. It says what you believe, meaning the meanings that you gave the experiences of your life at a very young age, because on a moment by moment basis, as, as, you're, as you're growing throughout life, you're literally recording every experience. We can see in the first seven years of development that there's this massive proliferation of, of neural networks and synaptic connections in the brain. And a lot of that growth is the um, development of memories. And so in every instance, we're recording what's going on, what we see, what we smell, what we taste, what we touch, what we hear, but we're infusing into that structure of our brain a meaning. You know, money is hard to make, relationships never work out, I'm not good enough. You can't trust people. So these beliefs are formed at a very early age, actually into the structure of our brain. And now as an adult at 30, 40, 50, 60, when you're having some present moment experience, your system is looking at what it matches up to from the past and what meaning you gave from the past. And it's bringing it up as a thought in the present moment. So, you know, when I was a, a kid, I was working on a school project in the first grade and my dad was helping me. And he was meaning well, and I talk about this in, in my book, and um, we were doing some school project, building these, you know, this Catholic missionary out of paper mache and arts and crafts materials. And I had modified the design of the, of the project while my dad was off doing something else. And he came back and he said, oh, what did you do there? And I said, oh, I thought I'd move these things over here. And my dad said, well, why don't we just do it the way it is in the design? And he moved it back. And I like what Gabor Mate says. He says, trauma is not what happens to you. It's what happens inside of you. And what happened inside of me at that moment was, I don't know how to do things right. I did it wrong. And the challenge is that in, that now becomes a part of the lens through which I perceive my reality and the way that the brain and the nervous system and the human being operating system works. It's now looking for evidence to support that hypothesis that I don't know how to do things right. And it's ignoring anything that's not in alignment with that hypothesis. So you start just accumulating more and more of this idea that I don't know how to do things right. So now, you know, you're 45 years old trying to grow your business and you're stuck in procrastination or self-sabotage. And rather than doing the things you know you need to do to grow your business, you can't because there's this automatic reaction inside of you in your own voice that seems like it's coming from the head that says, I'm not going to know how to do it right. You're literally just reliving seven years old. So so this is fundamental, what we believe we think. And whenever these thoughts occur, it's an electrical activation in the brain. That electrical activation is transmitted through the nervous system. And we experience that as a feeling directly in alignment with the quality of the thought. So if you're thinking that you're not going to do something well, you're already going to start to feel rejected or feel not good enough. So your beliefs create your thoughts, your thoughts create your emotions, your emotions then determine what action you take. And so in a case like this, Many people will do something to soothe themselves rather than take the productive action to grow their business or to um, improve their health or to improve their relationships. Your feelings determine your actions. Sometimes those feelings move you into inaction. 
right? Which is which for for a good part of humanity, that's the case. We move into into fight, flight, or freeze, and we start freezing, and then those actions determine your results, right? Your beliefs create thoughts, thoughts create emotions, emotions create actions, actions create results, and then the results, if we were to look at them, just reinforce the belief that it started with. But but it and that's what we call a psycho cybernetic loop. So that that's how thoughts become things. This idea becomes your reality. And I would call that the internal mechanism of it. And then the external mechanism of it is that all of this electrical activity that's taking place is vibrational. And we live in a vibrational reality. Everything is vibrational. I remember going back to my sixth grade science class where my teacher was like, hey, look, like the world is made up of these things called atoms. That's what comprises the material world. They organize to create molecules within the atom. You've got a a nucleus with neutrons and protons, and you've got an electron or a number of electrons that orbit. And if you want to think about it dimensionally, the size of this thing is as if you put the nucleus in a football field and the electron would be a tennis ball rotating around the parking lot. It's like it's almost all space. And yet we have this very physical experience of life. We have this physical experience of life because these, these curious particle waveform energy fluctuations that are the baseline of our reality very much when like neo sees through the matrix right it's like it's like this fluctuating shimmering energy gets interpreted into a physical reality by our senses that's why they're called senses we're sensing it it's it's not real that's why einstein said reality is an illusion albeit a persistent one so we're sensing information that our senses are translating into a physical experience But what's happening is as you're feeling these emotions as a result of the quality of these thoughts, you're vibing. And so you're you're putting a vibration out there and other people are picking up on those thoughts and ideas, those vibrations, they're translating them. Each of us is making thousands of unconscious decisions on a daily basis. And so, you know, lo and behold, you know, you end up rendezvousing with someone and creating a coincidence and a synchronicity. But, you know, these aren't acts of randomness, they're highly strategic, highly intelligent, sophisticated and coordinated occurrences. And so this is also how thoughts become things. And so, you know, it's very, very important to understand that you're creating your own reality because that begins the starting point of taking responsibility for the reality that you have rather than blaming external circumstances, blaming the chronic health condition, blaming the doctors who haven't been able to find a solution, blaming inflation, blaming a political party. We're creating our own reality. And if you want to change any aspect of your experience of life right now, you can, and you do so through a changed mind. Hey there, guys. We're about to dive in even deeper with David today, how to really reprogram your mind and your subconscious and also how to create from the fourth dimension. This is about to get super warpy. Come along with me on the journey. And just before we do, so many of you that are tuning in to the channel are subscribed to the channel and my heartfelt sincerest thank you to all of you that have subscribed to the channel thank you so much everything you see around here is powered and empowered by your subscription to the channel so deep deep gratitude for you and for those of you that are watching that haven't actually subscribed i'm just going to take a quick sec here please take a moment there's a button below a big button that says subscribe please do subscribe to the channel when you click it things light up it's a bit fancy Uh, but yeah it takes a moment but if you can do that it helps with everything we're doing here to champion positivity, wisdom, love, expansion of consciousness around the world. Thank you so much for being part of everything we're creating here in advance. Back to today's episode. I absolutely love that. And I love how you de- de- uh, de- explain beliefs, thoughts, feelings, actions, then results. And you you talk about that as the five primary drivers. And the, the story about yourself and your father, I, I I can't help but picture that, you know, like, and that's just one of so many instances we have growing up. And that was just such a minor moment, you know, it's like, hey, you're just building a, a clay project and your dad wasn't doing the wrong thing. You know, he was just coming from the best place in terms of like, oh, you know, I reckon I would do it like this sort of thing. And it always trips me out because those are just those one degree shifts. You know, how they talk about like the plane leaving the airport. If it was just off by one degrees, you know, when it tries to get to its destination, it's it's off by thousands and thousands and thousands of miles, you know, depending on how far away the destination is. And you look at that in your life, like how far off your center you end up for trying to please your loved ones because you're just ultimately just trying to seek more love um, in the 3D, in the material. Um, and so that, that 
linchpin how it all comes back around into your beliefs beliefs thoughts feelings actions results then again virtuously or you know viciously affirming your beliefs once again um, exactly and then you moving back into the space yeah, it's not, it's not that it's a bad thing the way that the human being operating system works this way. Any, anywhere you're creating results that you want, it's because the system operates this way, right? The brain is a goal-achieving machine. The, the challenge is, is when we've got these limiting beliefs or these misunderstandings, uh, and, 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 and we know that we've got them because we're experiencing things in our life that we don't prefer. You know, a lot of people ask, well, okay, if, if my beliefs are creating my reality, how do I become aware of what those limiting beliefs or what those thoughts are. And the answer is, well, look into your reality, identify circumstances or situations that you don't prefer, and notice your reaction to them. Because your reaction to them is not in effect of the situation. Your reaction is what created them in the first place, right? Can you unpack can you unpack that a little bit further? Because you also go on to say the the best way to build a life you love is to love the life you live. Sure. And that was the, that that yeah. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> yeah, so so the I the idea is that we're creating our own reality. We're doing that through the thoughts and habit of emotions that we have. And there's some experience that either we're having in our reality that we want to change, we would call that a problem. Or there's something that we want to create, right? There's like a new desire. And the most important work that we can do if we want to create change is do a personal audit to see if you've got any resistance to the experience of your life. And so if you're wanting to become aware of the limiting beliefs, for example, that, are, that you believe might be preventing you from the next level of financial security and abundance, look at your current financial situation and inventory what you think about it. Because if you inventory what you think about it, you just take a piece of paper, write it down. Money is hard to make. Money is scarce. Money causes problems. Money is the root of all evil. Money comes, but it doesn't stay very long. You have to work really you know, hard to miss. You have to sacrifice important things in your life to make more money. Okay, got it. So that's what you think about money in your life right now. But realize you don't think that because of the way money is. You've been thinking that for a long time. That's why money is that way for you. You talk about more and I really want to unpack this concept of more because I think a lot of us are driving towards more money, more relationships, uh, more peace even for some people, more spirituality. Um, and, you know, I, I, I put my hand up. I, I definitely, you know, oh, more. You know, there's this, there's this pursuit for more. Um, and yet it was really profound feeling into your distillation of what more really means for us. Yeah. So I think more is a natural part of who we are. We're, we're creators. We're a creative species. We're a creative technology. Um, you know, other great teachers that I like, like Abraham, who Esther Chick Hicks channels, right. Talks about how we are the leading edge of creation in the universe. We're on the leading edge. And so there's nothing wrong with, with wanting more. The challenge is that we've been playing the more game the wrong way. On one hand, we desire more in order to give ourselves permission to love ourselves. And that's not an authentic, effective reason to want to create. That doesn't come from uh, a unique place inside of ourselves. It's very similar to wanting more money to get out of financial insecurity. And so that's not how money works. Money is energy. Energy is looking to grow, to expand, to evolve. The universe doesn't perceive that you're in financial insecurity. The universe looks at it, if we want to kind of personify the universe or God or Jesus or however we want to call it, the, the universe is looking at it going, you've always had enough. Well, how do you know? Well, because you're right here right now. You've always had enough. Right. So you, you've always had enough, you have enough and you will always have enough. So this idea that you want more money in order to get out of not having enough, like that breaks the system. That's not in alignment with prosperity and abundance. So there could be, um, an unnatural motivation for wanting more. And so that becomes problematic from the beginning. But let's say there are things that you just truly want. You know, you, you want to make more money so that you can hire more employees and so that you can, 
pay for your children's education and so that you and your wife can go out and have nice dinners and you want more money because you want to buy a boat. You want more money because you want to give more philanthropically. There's nothing wrong with wanting more. But but we were taught bad mathematics in terms of how to achieve the more. The, the formula that the people who came before us gave us looks something like desire or more plus hustle and grind equals desired result. Or desire plus sacrifice your health and sacrifice your relationships equals desired result. Or desire plus come up with the perfect plan and execute on it flawlessly equals desired result. Or desire equals find the magic healer on top of the mountain with the special protocol and you can produce the desired result. There was a, before 1543, all of the scientists believed that the uh, earth was the center of the solar system. It was called the geocentric model. And so, and they tried to justify all their bad math. And every once in a while, the bad math would line up by coincidence with some result. And they'd say, see, the math is right. And the earth is the center of the universe. And then in 1543, Copernicus came along and just gave like a astronomical mic drop. And he said, hey, look, like it's not the earth at the center of the universe. It's the sun at the center of the universe. And now when they put the sun at the center of the universe, all the math made sense and the heliocentric model emerged. So what's happening now is we're starting to discover the, the good math. And the good math is this equation. Desire plus non-resistance equals desired result. Desire plus non-resistance equals desired result. So it's great that you want more. But the way you create more is not hustle or grind or sacrifice or know the right people or be born to the, you know, the lucky DNA club. Anybody can create more, especially if it's something that you authentically want to create, not to fill a hole inside of yourself. And you do that by having the desire and being non-resistant. 100% of the time, consistently and predictably, you'll produce the desired result. And so the work that we do in our coaching starts out with two questions for the most part, especially with new students. Number one is, what do you want? We want to know what the desire is. Number two is, what's the problem? As they start explaining to us all the reasons or rules, both from their own life or globally or philosophically, that is the problem, that is the explanation for why they don't have it yet or why they may never have it or why it's taking longer than they think, boom, we've got the resistance. And we know that the resistance is a set of thoughts and ideas that aren't inherently true and can be transformed. They're limiting beliefs. And 100% of the time, they're just derivatives of the early childhood beliefs that someone developed right? Those were their rules. They learned it from their parents. They had some incident before the age of seven that shaped the way they look at life. And then once we can remove that resistance, just like I talked about before, if you believe that you will be healthy and that your body has the capacity to restore its own health, then you'll have thoughts related to that, emotions related to that, actions related to that that you will take, and it'll 100% consistently produce the results. Same thing with money, same thing with relationships. So everything, you know, I have some really big goals right now. You know, my, my wife and I are creating a $100 million coaching company. We're launching a second company that I believe is going to be a multi-billion dollar transformational company. And since 2015, my intention has been to run for and become president of the United States in 2032. And, and I have the highest level of confidence that I'm going to achieve all of those outcomes, those desires for more than I have, because I understand the heliocentric model. Desire plus non-resistance equals desired results. So I don't wake up every day with my list of to-dos and all that stuff and beat myself up that I don't get it done and there's not enough time. My whole game is I already placed my order to the field of what I want. Now my job is just to continue to do the healing work and re-educate myself into non-resistance. We could talk about what that looks like, but that that is the game. Hey there guys, quick question for you. What are you taking away from today's conversation? Spirituality, mindset, entrepreneurship. There is so much going on in here. David is really incredible. I love his body of work and how to reprogram your mind, create from the fourth dimension. What are you taking away? I'd love to hear from you in the comments below.
Yeah, so I do want to talk more about the resistance pieces and how to unlock that because you've got some really simple yet effective ways to approach that. But when we're talking about the field and placing our orders as well, there's a real piece in there which, you know, you bring some really big goals to the table here at the moment, like, you know, running for president uh, in 2032 and, you know, you've <laughs> well on your way for this $100 million coaching business, which is incredible the work that it's doing for the world. Um the key thing though is conviction and faith because I think many of us can sort of put a put a pie up in the sky and kind of go, I hope that comes true. But the the conviction, the follow through, the, the you know, you've got to have this. Can you describe what's required to build that conviction and also the importance of conviction and faith to actually deliver the results you're looking for? <clears throat> yeah, it, it was built over time. It wasn't built overnight, and I'm still building it. You know, my my. My first faith building activity was the fact that I was able to get sober. Like I thought there was no way that I was ever going to get sober. I had been drinking and drugging and sexing for so long. I'd tried so many times to stop. Like I said, we have this thing in 12 step recovery where like, let's say your thing is to not smoke marijuana. That's what you're in recovery for. And you go 30 days, you get a, you get a 30 day chip. But if you go smoke marijuana, you come in and you get a one day chip, a 24 hour chip. It's a recommitment chip. I was known as one chip Dave. It would just uh, a, a, a white chip. It's called a white chip. I was known as white chip Dave. Every day I'd come in and get a white chip, white chip, white chip. And I was like, man, this is never going to change. Like, and I started working the 12 steps and foundation to the 12 steps are the first three steps where um, the abbreviated version of it is I can't solve this on my own. There is one who can, which is my higher power, and I will let it. And so in 12-step, I, I built faith in a power greater than myself. Some people believe in God, but they doubt a lot, God's capacity. Some people believe in universal principles, um, but they also think that they're working in some areas of their life, but not in others. It, so it doesn't, to me, really matter what you call it as for most people, God, Jesus, Allah, the universe, the field. The work is to deepen our trust that it's functioning for our greatest growth, our greatest prosperity, and our greatest evolution in all areas of our life. So I first got my faith in 12-step. Then I started studying metaphysics. And I started looking at what scripture was talking about through the lens of the great metaphysical teachers in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and the New Thought Movement people like Florence Goldwell Shin, um, Neville Goddard. And it was like, wow, this is an explanation of laws of how consciousness functions. Th these are, these are pre-physics laws. These are metaphysical principles. They're, they're an understanding of how energy works and spirit works and soul works and how the superorganism of life itself functions as a whole and my way to relate to it as an individual piece of that whole. And then I started testing it. Um, I can't remember if I tell the story in the book or not, but there was one point where I decided that I was going to make $60,000 from a source that was not my business by the end of the year. And through a series of insane synchronicities and coincidences, yes, I was involved in it. I, I was an action agent within the structure of what occurred. Um, on December 28th, I got a check for $60,000. Uh, then I made a decision. Uh, I had been single for 10 years. That um, so that at the end of 2012, right, I was creating a vision board, like leading up to my New Year's resolutions. And I decided I was going to meet a beautiful Colombian woman and make her my wife. Two weeks later, I met Carol, my wife, a beautiful Colombian woman. So enough of this happens that you're like, OK, I, I, I understand that I'm creating my reality. And so now I start to get curious about. But wait a minute. But I've been I, I've been I've been thinking towards the outcome of this thing, but I'm getting something different. Like, how come this piece seems to be more of a struggle in, in me creating what I want? And some of these other things come even more easily. And so, you know, my, my process over the last 10 years has been to play in the fringes of personal growth. Those questions like, how come some limiting beliefs are easy to change, but other ones seem like they stick around forever and I can't shift them? Um, hey, how come I make this new decision and I develop a new belief, but then two weeks later, the old thing shows up at like 10 times the magnitude. There, there are answers to all of these questions. But um, my, my process was a process over time through intellectual understanding of what I was studying, um, actual experiences that I was having, 
and and a spiritual awakening that is still taking place because by no means am I a master sitting on top of a mountain. You know, I'm working it every day. I'm working it every day, one day at a time. What what is um behind yeah why some limiting beliefs are easier to shift than others? Um, I've always just sort of leaned into after a while, kind of going shit that keeps showing back up. Maybe my soul's here to learn those particular set of lessons in this lifetime. Maybe it's a karmic thing, touch wood. But maybe that's uh, as I'm saying that. Maybe it's a cop out. I don't know. Well, yeah. What do you, what do you what have you found? Look, a lot of times it's a yes and, and you know, ultimately what you believe becomes your reality. So if you believe it's a karmic thing, I guess it is, right? But um, there are two things that we found um, that I think isn't really spoken about in personal growth in the traditional personal growth sense. So one is there's like, let's call it the run of the mill limiting beliefs. Um, and I think that makes up 50% of the inner resistance that most people experience. Things from like, there's not enough time to money's hard to make. And, you know, if we want, we can dive into the decision matrix and how beliefs are decisions. But we have a, we have a tool that really helps people with those low hanging limiting beliefs. It's highly effective. Please. Yeah. Um, the, the, the second thing, and this was, I, I had a, a, a breakdown in early 2022. I had a lot of things going on and, and I, I literally had a, a breakdown. Uh, I don't know how else to put it. And I went back into working 12 step, not around alcohol or drugs or sex, but around chronic worry. And as I was working the 12 steps again, uh, I got to the step where you identify your resentments and then you forgive your resentments. And I was like, holy, so many of the limiting beliefs that I'm still holding on to, I'm holding on to because I'm still holding on to the people through resentment. So your, your, your belief systems are formed almost always in interpersonal relationships. So if, if you experience that dad, quote unquote, made you feel not good enough, you can work on not good enough till the cows come home. But until you let go of dad, you can't let go of that limiting belief. So resentments and forgiveness are a huge part of the beliefs transformation process. And then there's, there's one more piece. So you've got your run-of-the-mill limiting beliefs, and we can talk about the decision matrix. You've got uh, resentments and forgiveness. And so we have a whole process we take people through to inventory their resentments and to um, help them see forgiveness. And the third thing is called the core program. And what I found is that ev every person, we've had over 10,000 coaching conversations in our organization, working with thousands of entrepreneurs. So it's a big data set, Right. Um, I mean, I've been coaching for a long time, but now I have teams of coaches. We have over 300 certified coaches and we look at the data and I was at an event that I was, uh, obviously I was at the event, I was hosting it, but it was uh, one of my three day business retreats for entrepreneurs. And a woman stood up and she said, I've, I've been in your work for a while. I've been doing the decision matrix. I did your courses. It's helped me clear out so many limiting beliefs. She's like, but I keep working this one limiting belief over and over and over and over again. And like, I cannot get rid of it. And this was about a month after I had discovered for myself my core program. And the core program is like a super limiting belief. Um, for me, it's there's something wrong with me. So, so mine is there's something wrong with me. It materializes as chronic worry. I'm afraid I'm going to do something wrong in my business, in my relationship. It's also materialized in my body as chronic health conditions. Because that's a great way to justify there's something wrong with me, right? There's something wrong with me. I need doctors to fix it. And so every person has a core program. For another friend Can of I mine, just jump sure. in there for a sec. You Sorry, can. Dave. Yeah. Just just because also you you had a mother that was a consistent warrior, and then you Correct. had a dad who was also like quite critical of things as well. And there was that Correct. dance between them, and that's you know trickled down. I just wanted to sort of. Just emphasize again, we talked about it earlier, how those things yes. happen. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, and you bring up a good point. So your core program is as if you took like the biggest limiting belief you got from your mom or dad that they held as well. It's their core program. Uh, and 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 as if as if it had a baby. That's your core program. And and so it it forms the nucleus of your personality at a very early age. It's the it's the um, an unidentifiable trauma usually because it's not overt. Um, and it's what some healers will call the unhealable wound. And so no matter how much ayahuasca you drink or how many great tools like mine you use or how many times you go jumping up and down in an event, no matter how much therapy you do, it, you still have your core program. And so, and the core program picks up momentum at about the age of 35 to 45. 
because it's it's neurological. So it's a defense mechanism. It's an aspect of your personality that was developed early on. And so, for example, this idea that there's something wrong with me drove me to be good at academics, drove me to be an early stage entrepreneur, drove me to develop a high mental acuity, right? And But by the time you get to about 35 to 45, it, it, it neurologically overtakes the system. And so you may have experienced or you may know people who have experienced this feeling of burnout and the thing that they believe once got them to where they are is now the thing that's suffocating them in their life. That's the core program. And it becomes a very confusing period of time because you actually try to apply that behavior to solve the core program. And you just get more of, and this is what happens in, in drug, drug addiction and alcoholism because it's an addiction. It's an addiction to a set of thoughts and behaviors and perceptions. And even though you know that trying to go about solving this problem, whatever it is, the same way is going to produce the same results, you still keep doing it. Trying to dig so, yourself out with the same shovel. Yeah. Yep. So it creates insanity in your life, powerless in your life, and unmanageability in your life. The good news is, it's actually the seed for the next level of your growth. Uh, all of the things that you're actually looking for, the next level of your genius, the next level of clarity, the next level of financial abundance, it's all packaged up in this compressed energy of the core program. And the way to actually transform the core program into your next level of genius and who you're becoming is the process of surrender, which is a very misunderstood concept. So everything in your system is going to tell you to go do the core program to solve the problem. And we have a process by which we essentially teach people to go do anything else. Go do anything else other than try to solve your health problem, try to solve your financial problem, try to solve your business problem, step away from the problem and get into the frequency of solution. And this is actually the mechanism by which a higher power brings us back into relationship with it. So if you're looking for a deeper spiritual connection, likely you're also struggling with your core program because spirit is wanting you to let go of your core program to it, and then you get to have it all. Then you're no longer carrying this burden. You have a deeper spiritual connection, and you've unpackaged all of this compressed trauma and energy into new ideas and clarity and alignment and health and prosperity and abundance. And so there's a whole process for that. But your question was, hey, like how come some limiting beliefs are harder to get rid of? And my answer is because a limiting belief is not a limiting belief is not a limiting belief. Hi there, guys. I wanted to take a quick moment just to introduce you to my one-to-one -one coaching. It's something that I deeply love doing. As you can tell, conscious conversation is such a massive part of my life. And having one-to-one -one deep, meaningful conversations with people where I get to show up as your brother or as the coach or as your mentor has been such a gift for me personally and a gift for lots of the people that I have supported on the journey of living a more spiritually empowered, spiritually powered, spiritually aligned life. You don't have to take my word for it. Here's some examples of people all around the world that have experienced profound transformations through this coaching experience. Amrit is a fantastic coach. In a few sessions, he got to a depth that I'd only experienced before working with certain medicines. And He's gone through a lot of the struggles that you're probably facing. And Amrit's been a really strong, supportive figure in my journey. In control of myself. I'm kinder to myself. I actually have that vision and a purpose. I do feel like I'm a better version of myself already. Amazing energy. He was easy to talk to, which made me easy to trust him. Working with Emmett at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and really I was bouncing out of bed. Whenever I get off the calls with Emmett, best money we've ever spent. <laughs> I would not recommend him because I don't want everyone to know about him and then I won't be able to book him. If he gets too busy, I won't get my turn. I would say absolutely. There's no way you can work with Amrit for a period of time without being transformed. So if you're considering him as a coach, do not hesitate because you won't be disappointed. Alrighty, so hopefully that's inspiring your evolution onwards and upwards. And if you are so inspired to evolve, you can book in a one-to-one -one call with me directly at www.amrit.coach forward slash life. And guys, if I can say so myself, I do think this is something quite special. Most people that I see building things online don't really work with people this deeply 
this intimately one on one as things start to grow, just because it is so time intensive. And yet I'm so deeply passionate about the transformation that comes from one to one coaching that just isn't available anywhere else. It would be my absolute honor and a pleasure to support your spiritual awakening, your spiritual path, your spiritual unfoldment. It is my life's work. I look forward to seeing you in the call. Back to today's podcast. Just at this juncture, because I feel like we're talking about beliefs and still they can be something that people are tuning into that feel wispy, feel etheric, and yet feeling into your work, you really ground it in. And I think it's not just beliefs that you ground in. You talk about personal development 1.0 versus personal development 2.0. Maybe this is a great place for you to just illustrate the point uh, between the two because you've mentioned it a couple of times in this conversation already. But then also beliefs, because after feeling into your or tuning into your work, it's the space between the synapses, like I, I'm, I'm programming your answer. I'll shut up. I'll let you speak. <laughs> no, tell me the space between the synapses. Go for it. Yeah. That actually connects the different things that are happening, that actually sparking in your mind between thoughts and those like, it's almost like that. It's, it's not the gray matter in your mind, but it is the sort of, yeah, the intelligence that is beyond the actual like wired intelligence in your mind. It's, I almost see it as the space between those firing synapses that you've described is like that's where your beliefs are. You're firing in a certain way because things are being held by the field in a certain way. So if you can change the structure of the field, um, that was my that was my download from from your work. Feel right, I got you. I'm, yeah, no, I'm look, there's path. a lot of theory. We'll we'll do the theory for a second and then get into the practical for people. You know, because it's interesting to talk about like are are, are beliefs actually in the brain? Are thoughts in the brain? Or is the brain just a receiving device that's very complex with all of its wiring? And depending upon which wires you activate or like what channel you tune to, then you have access to the information, which are the thoughts or ideas. Yeah. So there's 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 a lot of idea out there that, that consciousness does not reside inside the head. Consciousness is a field that is everywhere that holds all of this information. And we have the ability to tune into that information, you know, through through the specific emotions that we activate or our habits of thought. I think that to make this accessible for people, because yeah, where where, where are beliefs? Number one, it's important to understand that. Let's let's just suggest beliefs are part of the wiring of your brain, even though we just said it could be a different hypothesis. Let's just say that that that, that the beliefs are wired into your brain and you have the ability to rewire yourself. And then you say, okay, well, how do I, how do I rewire myself? And one of the most powerful distinctions that I, I became aware of was at this point in time where I was giving up on personal growth. And this is where I talk about personal growth 1.0 versus personal growth 2.0. Personal growth 1.0 was a lot of the information, the inspiration, the motivation, some incremental changes in the way that I was thinking. But not the promises of all the different spiritual teachers and personal development gurus. Kind of made things worse at some point. Kind of makes things worse because you feel like you suck at your own personal growth. Yeah, it's like everybody else is making it sound like you can just get to the other side, but I'm I'm stuck in this self-help purgatory now where I'm like super aware of my limiting beliefs and I feel like I have even more that I don't know how to transform. But that's a natural part of the process. It it because that invokes within us a desire for more. You know, it whenever we're experiencing a challenge or a problem, it's an invoking a desire for more. And as we talked about before, the key is to allow the more but move into non-resistance, not allow the more but focus on the problem. That tends to be what we do. So we get stuck in personal growth and then we find a teacher that helps us. That was my experience or some distinctions that we become aware of. And the distinction that I became aware of that really helped me work with my beliefs at a deeper level was that beliefs are decisions. So when, you know, when that, when when I concluded that I didn't know how to do it right with my dad in that school project, that was a decision. It was an unconscious decision and it happened in an instant, but I'm very concrete. Yeah. I'm very clear that it was a decision that I made. So I started playing around with this idea of like, well, but if I just made a decision back then, can't I just make a new decision right now? And if all of the evidence I have in my life for why I don't know how to do it right is simply a byproduct of, well, that's what the brain does. Once you make the original decision, it starts to accumulate all the evidence that supports it and ignore everything else. Like, 
why can't I just make a new decision? And then I even got curious. I was like, doesn't that mean that I might even have memories that that support a different belief, but like I'm just not consciously aware of them? And so I started researching neuroscience and neuroscience says 88% of your perceptive reality, you're registering, but not consciously. You're only paying attention to 12%. And that 12% you're paying attention to is what's in alignment with your belief. So I started messing around with this and uh, and started taking my limiting beliefs and knowing that they were actually decisions, making a new decision. So I made a decision that money was easy to make. And I made a decision that I was lovable. And I made a decision that I can trust people. And I made a decision that there's plenty of time to get done the things that are important to me to get done. Because I was looking at all these limiting beliefs I had about not enough time, I'm not lovable, all this stuff. And then I created a third step, which was asking myself this question, what evidence do I have for the fact that the new decision is true? And in the beginning, it was a little bit uncomfortable because I'm like, well, I don't, I don't really have any evidence. But as I sat with it, I was like, oh, well, there was this one time. Mm-hmm. And then once I allowed that one time, I was like, oh, and then there was this other time. And then there wouldn't even be experiential evidence. I'd be like, oh, well, I believe this. Like, I really do believe this about how it works and the universe works. And before I knew it, after I kept asking myself that question, I'd write down five, six, seven, eight things. All of a sudden, the new decision seemed way more true to me than the limiting belief that 10 minutes before was my truth. And so I developed this structure called the decision matrix. And again, we've probably just delivered the decision matrix tens of thousands of times now. I mean, people are using it all over the world to support them in the transformation of these beliefs. And it's really powerful because when you make a new decision, like when you get that beliefs are decisions and you're willing to make a new decision, everything starts to reorient and recalibrate because that, that new decision starts to change the thoughts and ideas you have on a moment by moment basis, right? Because if you have a limiting belief that nobody will pay me for what I do, but you make a new decision that says there are thousands of people out there would happily pay me for what I do, and you can find evidence for the fact that that's true, now you start to have thoughts as a person who believes there are thousands of people out there who will pay you for what you do. So you start having new thoughts and ideas. That's number one. Number two is you start paying attention to different things, right? There's a part of your brain. It's called the reticular activating system. You know this. It's that part of your brain where you buy the car and then you see the car everywhere on the road. Well, a lot of the entrepreneurs we work with, we just get them to believe that people will pay them what they're worth. And then they go, oh my God, I got a new client and it was somebody I already knew. And it's like, well, yeah, of course, because that person was all but invisible to you because it wasn't in alignment with what you believed. So new decisions transform the way you think. New decisions transform your perception of reality. And the new decisions start to organize the cooperative components, the synchronicities and then the coincidences in a more supportive way. And so now you're, you're working in the flow of information. You're working with the flow of life. You're consciously co-creating. And so, you know, for the first year and a half of my personal growth, I would just wake up every morning. I woke up stressed all the time. I would write out all the crap that was in my head. Many days it was the same thing. And I would put it on the left side of a page. In the middle, I'd write down exactly the opposite. I'd make a new decision. And then in the third column, I'd say, what evidence do I have for the fact that this is true? And so by the time I get down to the fifth or sixth one, I'm like, no, I think I'm good. I'm going on into my day. Like I feel much better. I move from a a primal state into a powerful state of being. And so this is, this is a process called, you know, neural pruning. You, you literally start to deactivate because when you're not in this work, you'll just keep, you'll follow that rabbit trail and you'll think those thoughts all day long that you're not good enough or that you can't trust people or but this, this sets you up to just do reps in a different direction and things can change very, very quickly. I really feel like this is where your work takes flight into a, a whole nother dimension um, in the spiritual development, personal development space, because I think talking about 1.0, we, we, we I've met many people tuning into this conversation. I know it's taken us an hour to get here in this podcast, but thank you for following along. Limiting beliefs. Yes, we discussed that. And then also new empowering decisions like reprogramming those. And I love how for you, it was, you know, it's, it's, you just cut the cheese and the fat so well. It's just like, Hey, that's your limiting belief. Just, just go for the opposite for just a quick sec, right? Come up with a new empowering decision in the decision-making matrix. But where we step into a whole new altitude is existing evidence 
of the new decision. And I think that's really this linchpin where you ground in the new reality, but without even actually having to take too much action, really, it's Correct. reprogramming your belief system and structure, bro. Like I can't, that, that piece there, I just want to like just zoom in on there for a sec before we get into um, the primal versus powerful state. Cause I think that's a whole new dimension that your work really opens up into. That, that's a really good point. I'm, I'm glad you brought that back because the missing piece for, if I can say like all of us, uh, is integration. And that's the frustrating thing in personal development 1.0 is we have all the information, but it's the integration. And, you know, I had done a lot of work. I did the whole landmark education series, I did all the Tony Robbins work, read all the books, the Wayne Dyer, um, never really got into Joe Dispenza because by then I was kind of doing my own teaching, but I hear his work is great. You know, going to India, doing breath work, fasting, psilocybin, ayahuasca, MDMA. I mean, you've heard my story. Like I went down the rabbit trail and the, uh, one of the things that I realized is that a lot of the earlier technologies that I was trying to use to change my beliefs didn't work because they weren't sourcing evidence from my own experience. So this is a lot of like, I have no problem with incantations and affirmations, and I think they have a proper, they, they, a proper timeline in your kind of personal development toolkit. But a lot of people get into affirmations and incantations too early because you're, you're just saying something and you haven't sourced any evidence from your own life to support it. And that actually creates even more resistance. Or someone else, you can work with a coach, will tell you what they believe, maybe based on some evidence they have in their own life, but you're not, you have to source it from your own. There's no faster and permanent way to create a change in the way that you think than to actually source evidence from your own life to show yourself that your limiting belief is untrue. And so like, if that's true, if we realize that, there's no faster way to obliterate a limiting belief than to actually source evidence from your own life to see that it's untrue and simultaneously source evidence from your own life to see that an empowered belief or a new decision is true, man, that's, that's it. And so now we go, well, how do we get there? And we just ended up getting there through some simple questions in a simple process, there is a willingness, you know, like I said, sometimes I'm working a limiting belief and it doesn't seem like I have any evidence for the fact that it's true. I lost my 14 year old Chihuahua. He was like the love of my life before I met my wife and had my son. He was with me in my addiction and the David after recovery. And when I lost him, I was in a tremendous amount of suffering. And, uh, after about 48 hours of just being in extreme pain, both me and my wife, I decided like, well, let me, let me see what my framework would say about this. And so we're going to get into powerful and primal states, but I'll intro it right now. One of the things we teach is that there's only two states of being, powerful states and primal states of being. And powerful states are states of being that feel good, like joy, curiosity, excitement, compassion, passion. And those are states that we experience from the parasympathetic nervous system when we're in rest and relaxation. It's really our connection to spirit is that state of being. Then there are primal states of being, states like boredom, anger, fear, jealousy, overwhelm, stress, judgment, criticism, and all the behaviors that go along with it, states of being that don't feel good. And that's when we're in the sympathetic expression of the nervous system. We're reactive. We're not using the advanced tools of the advanced human being. We're using the primal human. You're always in one state of being or the other. And you're never in two states of being at the same time. And so... Do you if, describe, if you, describe the ahead. states a little bit? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was going to get no, you to describe okay. the states a little bit. Okay. So you're yeah. either happy or you're bored, right? You're, you're either calm or you're angry. And so we're always in an emotion, and this is a beautiful binary breakdown. You either feel good, you're in a powerful state of being, or you don't feel good, you're in a primal state of being. Just know you're always in a state of being and you're never in both at the same time. And so to me, this has become the guiding north of my spiritual practice because everything I want to create is going to come from a powerful state. That's where 
compassion, creativity, abundance, prosperity, healing, restoration, intuition, communing with God, whatever it looks like, that's coming from a powerful state of being. In a primal state, I don't get any of that. So personal development can feel very confusing. Like, where do I start? And I would say, start acknowledging that there are two states of being. And the name of the game is notice when you've moved into a primal state and move back into a powerful state of being. So then you go, well, how do I do that? How do I do that? You say, well, the next understanding we must have is that the thing that determines whether we're in a powerful state or in a primal state is not the experience. It's not how much money you have in your bank account. It's not how long this chronic health condition has been going on. It's not the argument you just had with your spouse. It's not that the marketing campaign didn't just work out. It's the meaning that you're giving the experience. The meaning that you're giving the experience that I'll never be well or that I'll never get out of this situation or it's never going to change, that's what's determining whether you're in a powerful state or a primal state. It's not the experience. Suffering is separate from the experience. And suffering is created by one thing and one thing only, which is our own thinking. So one more distinction as we lay, lay this out. After 10,000 coaching conversations, we realized something. Whenever we were working with our clients and they moved into a primal state, it was their thinking, not the experience itself. And when we identified what the thinking was, 100% of the time, it was a limiting belief. So by the time we took the thinking and we worked a decision matrix around it, they would take the thinking that was causing suffering, come up with a new decision, find evidence from their own life, and then they would say, that thing that I told you before that I was thinking that was causing me to move into a primal state, I don't think it's true anymore. And we were like, wow, this is crazy. Because what that means is that anytime you're thinking something that doesn't feel good, it's not true. So this became like a Pandora's box that got opened for me. So my chihuahua dies. And I'm talking about how sometimes it's hard to find the evidence. My chihuahua dies. I'm, of course, I'm in a primal state. So I apply my own methodology and I go, well, I know that Dexter dying is not why I'm suffering. It's what I'm thinking about Dexter dying. So I looked at my thoughts and I discovered I had this thought that I was never going to see Dexter again. That's what was causing me the most pain. So I said, well, if that doesn't feel good, it's not true. So some form of the opposite must be true. Now I'm working on a new decision, right? That's a limiting belief. The new decision was, I am going to see Dexter again. And then I said, okay, got it. What evidence do I have for the fact that this is true? And I came up against a brick wall. So that was the first time that I ever just put a pin in it. Two days later, I'm going for a run around the park. All of a sudden I have this idea to Google near-death experience pets. So I get on my phone, I Google near-death experience pets. There's a woman, she died for 23 minutes, crossed over, came back. When she crossed over, she met her collie, had a whole conversation with her collie, went on to talk about what it's like on the other side that was very in alignment with my belief systems, and then came back into life. And so the evidence that came to me was that I will see Dexter again on the other side. So when I realized that I will see Dexter again, I immediately moved out of suffering. Did I still miss him? Yes. Yeah. Do I wish he kind of lived longer? Sure. But he lived as long as he was supposed to. But what was causing me all this pain was not the loss of my furry friend. It was the belief that I was never going to see him again. And by working the process in the decision matrix, within 48 hours, I had a hunter and inclination. I went and Googled it and I got my answer. And can I just double click on this real quick? So I then said, why does death exist? Like in I was a hoping system, you'd go there. <laughs> I was in, so in hoping a, you'd go a, there. In a system, if this system is so perfect and always working for us, 
and can help us achieve any of the more that we want. And it's only asking us to be non-resistant, not to hustle and grind, not to be perfect, not to be smarter, but just get out of the way because this battle is not your battle to fight. It's the Lord's battle to win. That doesn't mean that we don't take action and we're not part of the system, but the game is so uh, designed in our favor and everything is loving. And that's what all the great spiritual teachers talked about. Why did this intelligence not just let Dexter live forever with me? And so this is what I came to realize. And these are the revelatory discoveries you can have when you clear the space of your limiting beliefs, because when your limiting beliefs are no longer taking up the space, new insights and revelations drop in. And this was mine in this particular instance. When Dexter died or left the physical, I missed him so much that I had a greater love for him than I ever could have possibly imagined having. I thought I loved my dog as much as I could possibly love my dog until my dog was no longer here. And now what I'm coming to understand is that after I finish this vacation called human, uh, being a human being, I'm going to go back to the other side and not only see Dexter again, but experience a thing called eternity with him with an even more expanded love for him. That's a brilliant system. That is a brilliant system that is always working for us. And it's just showing us that it's our misunderstanding of what's happening that is causing us our pain. But I do believe, just like in our own individual lives, there are things that happened to you and I, Amrit, years ago, where we look back and go, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. We're going to look back after we leave the physical body and be like, man, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. And all of this is going to become explained to us. But I think if we can apply these tools that, you know, I mean, some people might think what I just said is new age. I, I think it's a very practical approach to evaluating one's life and the experience of loss using your nervous system as an emotional guidance system and fundamental behavioral psychology principles and an understanding of metaphysics to start getting real about reality. Because I think the biggest problem right now is that most of us are not living in reality. We're living in some distorted version of it that's being driven by our fears. And we see that not only in our own individual lives, but we see that at a macro social level as well. I mean, how does one ask a question after you've helped reconcile so much around <laughs> the heaviness of, of death? That is beyond profound that the entire experience of death is also there as a mechanism to encourage deeper and deeper levels of love. And, you know, you mentioned this quite a few times, uh, or maybe it's just in my mind, but the, the Einstein quote that you, you've got an important decision, you know, we talked about beliefs and decisions on your hand, you know, you're either going to make the decision that the universe you live in is hostile or it's your greatest ally, you know, he says um, it's the most important decision, right? Whether you live in a friendly or a hostile universe. And to reconcile that with what you've just shared, like there is, you know, there's been some really close people that I've lost. I've, I've lost a mentor uh, a few years ago and, and just the truth of, of what you're sharing in terms of how much more she means to me. Um, and, and I didn't realize, you know, like, well, no, I didn't realize I loved her a lot, touch wood. Um, and then also her transition, like how that love has grown and matured and, you know, just the everlasting nature of it continued to um, be elicited and impressed upon me as she's gone, but I still form, you know, a, uh, I still have the bond. Um, that has been nothing short of profound. And you're right, the love, the love has deepened. And I don't think it's new age. I think it's actually, if we sit with that, that is, that you, <laughs> that's a, <laughs> it's like, yeah, there's more than enough <laughs> in this podcast already, but that in and of alone of itself because well, um, there is so much heaviness every, around death. Yeah, every contraction has an expansion on the other side of it, and so you know these 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 misunderstandings that we have, these limiting beliefs, these childhood traumas, are simply creating compressed information inside of us. And as we learn how to let go of the resistance, they metabolize, they they transform into expansion, and, and that is fundamental to the creative process. Right. So we, we, we experience the contraction of the loss of a loved one, and then we get to experience the thrill and exhilaration of the expansion when we're with them on the other side. And it's the same thing I witnessed and you witnessed with the, 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 the miracle that our wives go through as they're giving birth. Right. There's this, there's this contraction and then there's this expansion. And sometimes you feel like I just can't get through the contraction. And what is the coaching there? 
relax, relax, breathe, breathe, right? It's very yogic. It's very, and that I think is an effective approach to personal growth. We're going to experience these experiences on a day to day. Always want more. You're, you're a more making machine and that's great. And as you do, you're going to experience these experiences that you don't expect that we would call problems, but they will resolve. They will resolve on their own. They will resolve through the thoughts and ideas we have. If we can relax through them and be non-resistant, be in a powerful state. And then how do we execute that on a day-by-day basis? I mean, there's a portfolio of tools out there. Like we've got great tools. Other teachers have great tools, but it's the most, it's the most important practice to be in, right? Is your personal growth. I love that. And the key thing in there is I think just distilling down, because I don't think we've actually clearly stated it, but <laughs> the engineering me is obsessed with your work because it's just so binary, you know, the, the, the powerful state being linked to the parasympathetic. And it's just as simple as that. It's like, okay, are you in a relaxed nervous system state? And then the primal state being, are you in fight, flight or freeze? Yes. And you know, that is, it's just so one and zero. It's like, am I in a powerful state? Am I relaxed? Because most people are like, am I in a powerful state? And, you know, you can, your ego conjures up like power, <laughs> you know, and it's like, that's, <laughs> that's not power, bro. It's, are you relaxed? Like, are you actually, you know, the lion can just slumber in the jungle, you know, like he doesn't have to like assert his presence. He, he is who he is, you know, and the monkeys, like, I remember like traveling and I remember seeing these monkeys just, just relaxing on a branch. And I remember just looking at him, just going, shit, is it that possible to be like that relaxed? Like it looked like they didn't even have a spine, <laughs> you know? And I was just like, this is unbelievable. Like that has just st- set the status quo in my mind for what like parasympathetic nervous system unwinding relaxation looks like. Um, I'm a bit of a monkey, so <laughs> maybe that's why it spoke to me as well. Yeah. But, but nonetheless, <laughs> there was a real thing that sort of distilled in in that moment. But the, the powerful being the parasympathetic and the primal being the sympathetic, I think also for most people, especially a lot of people listening into this podcast, they're type A, they're high achievers, um, they're living in cities and just even just caffeine, like so many things just jacking us consistently into this primal, like tightening up contracted state. And I love what you said that every contraction has an expansion in there. If we can get that clear, like I've, I've always had the four level of consciousness as a conversation of like, Hey, there's four levels of consciousness. Level one, life is happening to you. Level two, life is happening by you. Level three, life is happening for you, which a big part of today's conversation has been around. And level four, life is happening as you in that oneness state. And I've carried that for the longest time, but I also acknowledge it's it's not um, as a model of consciousness, it's it's hard to tell where you are at any given time. And sometimes you feel like you're still a victim and sometimes you feel like, you know, life is totally happening for me and there's, it's, it's quite slippery. And yet your four levels of consciousness, which you introduced to us is the engineer in me is just like, Oh my God, this is just so practical. Can you describe, tell us a little bit about the four levels of consciousness that aren't those four levels, your four levels of consciousness that sort of build upon this being in a powerful state, being in your parasympathetic versus being in a primal state, being in your sympathetic jack nervous system. Yeah, I think it's measurable. So when when we realize that when we decided, look, the, the work we teach is, is is expansive, but it also has to be simple for people because integration is the missing piece. So if people want to go deeper and deeper, they can, right? Like talking about why does death exist in the system? That's a fringe concept. That's like not, it's not in the 101 playbook. Um but, but in the 101 playbook, it's like, okay, we've got two states of being. And so we ask people the inventory, if you were to add up all the time you spend in an average day, stress, anxious, overwhelmed, comparing yourself to other people in indecision, um, feeling guilty, judging yourself, judging others in resentment, you know, uh, any of those types of states of being or the actions that correlate with them that don't feel good how much on an average day do you spend in a primal state? And the average answer we get is between eight to 10 hours from, from people. A lot of people, it's like every waking hour. It's like, yeah, I get that. That's where I started. You know, I am only at peace when I sleep 50% of my day. And some people are at two hours, three hours, which is fantastic. If you're spending three hours a day in a primal state, it's still a thousand hours a year. And so, you know, a lot of people are looking for more time and more money 
It's like, well, a, a thousand hours a year is, uh, let me do the math here. It's like t- 25, 40 hour work weeks. So if you're wanting to launch a business or be healthier or what, like there's your time. Um, and then, you know, time is also money. So we measure the progression of someone's consciousness and then we see a correlation in terms of the improvement of their life based on a reduction of the amount of time and suffering in a primal state. And so um, I can't remember exactly what I put in the book, but, you know, basically eight hours or more is your sleep. And a lot of people who've been doing personal growth for a long time are asleep because of this missing integration piece, right? It's like either there's just a lot going on that you're not aware of that's moving you into a primal state, habits of thought, habits of emotion, unmetabolized trauma, that type of stuff, or you're aware of it, but you don't really know what to do with it. And then as you decrease the amount of time you spend in a primal state to say, you know, three to five hours a day, now you're, you're aware you have a deeper level of awareness. You're working with the material of awareness. And then as you reduce it even more, you're awake, let's say one to three hours a day. And when you start spending less than an hour a day in a primal state, we call that category phenomenon. Another way of looking at it could be genius because there's, there's so much that has become available now and you're so much more directly connected to yourself, to money, to health, to others, to your business, to God, to whatever, because that connection is not being broken anymore with the resistance of our limiting beliefs and the unmetabolized misunderstandings. Um, you start to produce really extraordinary things. And now you're, you're living at the fullest tilt of your, you know, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. You know, you, you are really one with your genius and the expression of what you're meant to do in the world. And you're not concerned about the time or speed of it. You're, you're not doubting whether or not it's going to happen. You're allowing it to unfold. And so the beauty is you're getting to enjoy your life. And the irony is, as you're enjoying your life, you're producing even more. And that doesn't mean that you may not be taking a lot of action by someone else's observation, you know, looking in. Um, but, but the results, the timing, the synchronicities are quite profound. So you're like you're now you're living your masterpiece life. And the good news is, is it's available to everybody. You know, this, 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 this mindset thing is a skill. It's not, right? It's a skill. It's a practice. And anyone can get good at it. And it doesn't matter how long you've been struggling with limiting beliefs or how deep your trauma was. I mean, I have a private client sexually abused by seven alcoholic stepfathers. Brother shot himself and died in his arms. Like, that's a trauma you put up against anybody's trauma if you want to have a trauma competition for whatever reason, Right. Within a year of this work, his life has completely changed uh, because he's done, your, his nervous system is downregulated. And uh, so it's, it's, it's an incredible opportunity if people choose to make mindset, um, treat mindset like their life depends on it, because it does. Hi there, guys. I wanted to take a quick moment just to introduce you to my one-to-one coaching. It's something that I deeply love doing. As you can tell, conscious conversation is such a massive part of my life. And having one-to-one deep, meaningful conversations with people where I get to show up as your brother or as the coach or as your mentor has been such a gift for me personally and a gift for lots of the people that I have supported on the journey of living a more spiritually empowered, spiritually powered, spiritually aligned life. You don't have to take my word for it. Here's some examples of people all around the world that have experienced profound transformations through this coaching experience. Amrit is a fantastic coach. In a few sessions, he got to a depth that I'd only experienced before working with certain medicines. And He's gone through a lot of the struggles that you're probably facing. And Amrit's been a really strong, supportive figure in my journey. In control of myself. I'm kinder to myself. I actually have that vision and a purpose. I do feel like I'm a better version of myself already. Amazing energy. He was easy to talk to, which made me easy to trust him. Working with Emmerich at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and really I was bouncing out of bed. Whenever I get off the calls with Emmerich, best money we've ever spent. <laughs> I would not recommend him because I don't want everyone to know about him and then I won't be able to book him. If he gets too busy, I won't get my turn. I would say absolutely. There's no way you can work with Amrit for a period of time without being transformed. So if you're considering him as a coach, do not hesitate because you won't be disappointed.
Alrighty, so hopefully that's inspiring your evolution onwards and upwards. And if you are so inspired to evolve, you can book in a one-to-one -one call with me directly at www.amrit.coach forward slash life. And guys, if I can say so myself, I do think this is something quite special. Most people that I see building things online don't really work with people this deeply, this intimately, one-on-one -on -one as things start to grow, just because it is so time intensive. And yet I'm so deeply passionate about the transformation that comes from one-to-one -one coaching that just isn't available anywhere else. It would be my absolute honor and a pleasure to support your spiritual awakening, your spiritual path, your spiritual unfoldment. It is my life's work. I look forward to seeing you in the call. Back to today's podcast. How do we create from the fourth dimension? We're stepping now further into this expansive state. And you talk a little bit about this quite or quite, a, quite at length um, online about creating from the fourth dimension. What are you referring to there? Because I feel like once we've removed all of our limiting beliefs in today's conversation and we understand that now, we open up to what's possible in the new. Yeah, so I think that's a good point. Like there's two pieces of this work. One, and, and they can happen simultaneous, but one is let's understand how we quote unquote, heal those things that want to be healed. And then number two, now that we're no longer entangled and habituated to those things, what are the principles for creation? Right? Um, and you can do both simultaneously. It's not like you can't start creating more in your life because you've still got some limiting beliefs. I mean, I have plenty of limiting beliefs left. Um, fourth dimension. Different people have different perspectives on these dimensions. You know, there's nine dimensions, there's five dimensions, there's four dimensions. All, all I'm wanting to communicate when I talk about the fourth dimension is that everything that you create begins in an invisible realm. It's, it's coming from a place of imagination. Um, it's coming from, how else would we say it? Consciousness. And, you know, you, you asked this question, you said, you know, how do we create from the fourth dimension? Everybody is always creating from the fourth dimension. So <laughs> now whether, whether you're creating what you want from the fourth dimension or not, that's a different story, but, but, but everything once existed as an idea in imagination, and then it found its way into the third dimensional five senses as Neville Goddard would call it space, but everything starts in imagination. So we talked out about that a little bit earlier, right? It's, you know, a belief is just an idea, but that idea will then organize and attract into thoughts and those thoughts will catalyze emotion and those emotions will then motivate or demotivate action and those actions will produce results. That's how a thought becomes a thing. That's how something goes from a fourth dimensional space of idea or imagination into reality. And then simultaneous to that, as we have these ideas, as we visualize, as we imagine, life itself is receiving that request and it's organizing all the cooperative components to do the external part of creation. It's important to acknowledge too that our role is actually a very small role. That if you look at anything that you've ever created, 99.999999% of it is actually the coordination of external factors. So, just know that most of the work is being done the moment you ask. The moment you ask, and there's some lines in scripture, it's like before they speak, I hear them. It's like, wow, that's pretty fast. <laughs> you know, like bef before they even ask, I've answered. Like, oh, got it. Like uh, in, in the Quran, they talk about Allah is closer to you than your jugular vein, right? Like it's as close, it's in you, it's as close as it can be. And so every request is heard and every request is being worked on. Um, and so uh, we're, we're talking about the fourth dimension as this non-sensory space, this immaterial space where thoughts and ideas and energy coalesce and become organized into the third dimensional material space. And I would think a little bit more of it as like a live stream. So... You know, people oftentimes say, yeah, but if the fourth dimension is where everything comes from, how come I keep experiencing the same thing in my third dimensional reality? It's like, well, because you keep thinking the same thoughts and imagining the same thing in the fourth dimensional space. So it's changing every moment, but it's just broadcasting the same thing over and over and over again. And the key is to have a desire. The desire activates all of this in the fourth dimensional space and then to move into non-resistance. 
allow the space to organize, allow yourself to have thoughts and ideas. I'm not sitting, say, sitting on the sofa, eat cheesy poofs, watch Netflix. That's not non-resistance. That's resistance. That's actually an example of resistance, right? Somebody who's in resistance is doing that. Somebody who's living in non-resistance is out vibrantly living their life and pursuing the inspired ideas that come to them. But um, the other important thing to understand is a lot of people say, well, like, I'm not very, I don't, you know, I don't imagine. It's like, no, you're imagining all the time. Like, I believe that imagining is thinking. Thinking is imagining. So when you're thinking about something as you're driving from point A to point B, that's imagination. So we're always imagining and we're always materializing the imaginative concepts which exist in this sort of waveform energetic realm of consciousness into the third dimensional space through the miracles of the, our own thoughts and ideas that we choose to take action upon and the organization of the cooperative components through synchronicities and coincidences. So if you want to change something in your life, the mistake we make is we try to mess with the third dimensional space. But that's like, I think it was Plato's allegory of the cave. It's like the people are sitting there and they're chained up and there's a fire behind them and it's casting shadows on the wall and they think the shadows on the wall are real. Like trying to change the something going on in your reality by manipulating your reality or controlling your reality, which is what so many of us do or try, that's like not liking the end of Avengers Infinity Stones when Thanos snaps his fingers and kills everybody and trying to go up to the screen and remove the gemstones from his gauntlet. Like that doesn't make any sense. You want to change the scene, you go back and you change the movie and the projector and it projects. So we're all very, very much lost in this projected reality because, again, going back to what we talked about before, our senses interpret it into a very physical experience, so it seems real. But it's really just an effect of what originated in this thing we're calling the fourth dimension. It's really powerful because I have to admit, I never fully grasped the... Like Plato's allegory has always been um, difficult to digest in terms of... Oh, like he's alluding to Maya, but there's this other reality, which is actually real. And then there's projections of those real ideal manifestations of, let's say a horse. And we're seeing like the, the shadow aspect of the the horse in the 3d. And yet I find when I come, I don't, I don't know how you do it, David. I really don't know how you do it. It's like, as I come into your work, there's this, it's massively expanding. And yet, like you've used the term a few times, I'm just going to lean into it. It's binary, like ones and zeros. It just becomes super clear. You've, and I think there is this level of, and you know, I don't want to gas you up too hard, but it's, we can, it's our podcast. We can do whatever we want. It's, there's a certain level of mastery that is, you know, it, it becomes self-evident when things are simple to digest. Um, and I have to say, you know, coming into your work, it's the first time I've really gone, oh yeah, that I, I get what the allegory of the cave is referring to. You know, there's this whole body of work internally within us that is being shadowed out. Like that light within is actually reflecting in our 3D material reality. And Mysticism 101 goes on to say, you know, reality is not happening out there. Like just close your eyes. You're still happening. Like, but you're seeing reality happen in your head, but it's happening in your head, you know, and it's like therein starts the whole mystical journey. That's, um, that, that's a really good it, comment on mysticism too. And mysticism, that is where we can get lost in, you know, you had on this great Rosicrucian teacher. I don't remember what his name was. I loved watching that interview. Robert J. Gilbert. Yeah. Yeah. He's great. He's great. And I saw him on Andre's show and I've like, I've watched him a couple of times and my wife is now getting into this Waldorf way of living, which is an educational structure that was created by Rudolf Steiner, who was really the Rosicrucian who brought all this stuff public. And Rosicrucianism is basically taking all the disparate spiritual teachings like Himalayanism and the other Eastern teachings and the Holy Cross and the teachings of Jesus and incorporating them into a system. Um, and uh, one of the things I, I really like ab about that work is that like, it's about spiritual and material. And, and navigating through. And so I, I don't think we're well served if we're just like, yeah, reality is not real. It's like, well, but in this incarnation, that's how it's designed to be experienced. But let's understand the root cause of how this reality is materializing so that we can actually affect change, not only for ourselves, but you know, for, for the people we care about and ultimately for the world. Because what we're seeing in the world right now, you know, if someone came to me right now and 
said, hey, I'm, I'm experiencing a lot of financial insecurity in my life, I would say, well, let's take a look at your belief systems because you're experiencing something that you don't like and you have the opportunity to change it. And right now, we're experiencing a lot of things globally that we don't like, but I think we're kind of falling for the movie screen again. You know, these things are just a projection of the collective unprocessed traumas and fears that we're holding inside of ourselves. And so in the same way that we would improve our lives, if we want to improve the world, I think it goes back to the same thing, right? Like l learn, learn how to heal yourself and live more in faith than in fear. That was one of my big takeaways earlier on in our conversation as well, that faith is actually a skill. And I was going to comment on it, but the conversation went in a different direction, mm -hmm. that faith actually is a skill and it can be built because you said that you're like, actually faith is something I exercised and I developed. And I think for many of us, we sort of feel like we have it or we don't have it. I remember in my life, courage was one of those things. I thought it was, it was like, we either have it or we don't have it. And then I, I, my whole life changed when I was like, oh, courage, courage is a skill. Like you, 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 you exercise courage in the face of fear. Go look at your fears work towards them, do some fear setting, try and see what you can massage your way towards and gently overcome and conquer. And you actually become more courageous as you go. And that was a huge takeaway from today's mm. podcast, um, that faith is actually something uh, that you can develop. Now, Matthew, another piece of scripture, just while we're here, more will be given to those that, you know, have, That's and, you know, one like that has <laughs> irked me that has irked me forever and once again you know your teachings have really have really helped reconcile that to the nth degree please the floor is yours yeah so so, so matthew writes about a teaching which is to to whoever hath or ha whoever has even more shall be given and to whoever has not even that which they have shall be taken away and you read that and you go like how is that a loving universe or a loving system right? To the person who has stuff, they're going to have even more. And to the person who has very little, they'll be stripped of what they have. And it's, it's speaking to the momentum of this, you know, what is more, more contemporarily called law of attraction, right? It's talking to the momentum of like, if you've gotten to a place where you've created abundance for yourself, there's a momentum and you'll keep, keep creating more abundance. And if you're living in scarcity, even what little you have will be stripped away. And that's what's, you know, so many things that are so powerful. But again, I really appreciate like Florence Scovel Shin and Neville Goddard and these teachers of the early 1900s who interpreted the teachings of the Bible through the lens of laws of consciousness. Um, it, it helped me make sense of the Bible. And then that actually opened me up to looking at even more scripture and wanting to understand more about, you know, what's being spoken about. One of the things I've gotten into recently is... Um, the writings of C.S. Lewis. He wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and the whole Narnia series. And he discovered Christianity later in life. And I'm reading his book right now called Mere Christianity. And, uh, and he talks about God being a way maker, you know, and a way is always being made. And the universe is a way maker and the way is always being made. And so no matter what you're struggling with or what you want right now, going back to the more conversation, a way is being made. And, you know, uh, in scripture, it talks about, I make a way in the wilderness, streams and rivers in the desert. And so, you know, life works with us in a, in a higher level of thinking that we're capable of. And that just makes sense because if each and every one of us are just the individual expression of spirit, but there's this collective spirit that's called infinite intelligence, it's got pretty much a bird's eye view of everything. And so, you know, it's, 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 or, it's organizing all of humanity to support you in materializing into your life, not necessarily what you want, but what you believe. And the beautiful thing about it is, even if what you believe is in contradiction to what you want, as you continue to experience more of what you don't want, eventually that brings you to a waking up process. So the system is perfect and it's working all the time. And you know, you look at and this is an important metaphor to understand in our lives because we all get to a point where it's like, man, I've been working on this business forever and I just can't make it happen. And man, I've just been i been alone for so long and I just, I want to meet someone. And man, my relationship's been so toxic for so long. I just don't know if it can ever be better. And if you apply the principles that we're talking about here and that I go deeper on into the book and you start to look at where you're responsible and you start to clear out some of those limiting beliefs and those habits of thoughts and habits of emotion. And if you're willing to not focus on the problem, but get clear on what you want and what the desire is, another component is know that there's a great way maker that's making a way. And, and it works in such extraordinary ways. You know, like in the Bible, think about how crazy this is. In the Bible, Moses is leading the Hebrews out of slavery, slavery of the old life, slavery of the old mind, 
And they come up against the Red Sea and there's no way to go across. And God is the great way maker. The way we would have made a way is we'd be like, hey, let's organize some boats to carry the Hebrews across the Red Sea. God's like, that's not how I roll. I'm going to ask Moses to outstretch his hands and I'm going to part the Red Seas. In addition to that, that way you don't have to take a rocky ride across the Red Sea. You can just walk on dry land. But And we can go like, my God, it's the great way maker. And it's done that in our lives. Every time we thought there wasn't a way, a way became available. So yeah, look, this, this work is binary. There's a starting point. What do you want? What's the problem? Two states of being, beliefs or decisions, decision matrix, and then you go deeper and deeper and deeper. And part of that process is the development of faith because faith isn't a thing that you get. Faith is a thing that you do. And I, I could not give myself permission to have the faith that I have today if I hadn't understood all of these pieces, had tools to let go of the resistance that no longer served me to know that it was okay that I wanted more. You know, it's a big body of work, but, and that's why I think, I think the greatest hobby we can have or undertaking we can put upon ourselves is to understand how all this works. Cause what else matters? Every, everything else is just a byproduct of this. And I'm very excited because you know, it's not only my teachings. I think there are other great teachers that are emerging right now because I do think it's a time in our evolution and a time in consciousness where we're ready for tools. We're ready for tools for integration. And so those tools and those understandings are coming and they're coming in simpler and simpler forms that more and more people can access because we don't want to continue to live into our trauma and extinguish our species. And I'm 100% convinced that that's not going to be the case. You've heard me on my podcast. I believe in the certainty of the goodness of the future. And for anybody listening to your show right now, the time is now, right? Like as Jesus said, now is the appointed time. So let's get going. David Bayer. <laughs> <laughs> Officially, Brother Bear. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you so... Thank you. Oh, my God. How do I... Okay. Thank you for today's podcast. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, thank you so much. Not just for today's podcast. We've connected personally outside of this space. And yeah, your generosity, your spirit, your spirit. You're just... Today is just a, a, a taste of just how you show up in the world. And I'm so grateful for everything you do, the work, body of work you've put out in the world, but all of that really, you know, you've dug deep within yourself and to really uncover the gems and continuously doing this work and embodying it. You know, we, we talked at, even at the beginning of this podcast, and I hope you don't mind me sharing, like, you know, a couple of weeks ago you had, you had COVID going on and then you're like, how good is that? Like now I don't have to get it later. And I was just like, embody the principles much, bro. And, you know, like just a, a real, I guess the gratitude piece for you, just really grateful that you're here doing the work and it's just such a pleasure and honor to be connected to you um, and sharing your work with the world in this way is just my absolute pleasure and honor. So thank you so much for doing this with us. I will put a link to accessing your book in the show notes below. I'll also put a link to your YouTube channel in the show notes below and your website for everybody to go check out and changed mind book.com. Um, I hope you don't mind me sharing that with people because if you get into the book, you will get directed into the, into um, going to check out some of the diagrams and images there. But we discussed a lot of those things, the decision-making matrix, um, the five primary drivers and the ordinary models of thinking, how to hack your mind. Um, yeah. The higher power system. There's a lot of great tools in there. Changedmindbook.com as well. You guys can go check that out. I'll put a link to everything and all those rich resources in the show notes below. Brother, Thank you so much. Yeah, Amrit, I appreciate you, you just for being such a great leader and leading so many people into this information that's going to change their lives and change the world. So likewise, I know we talked about it. It's not easy. We got kids. We're working through stuff. You got a seven month old, but you just you, you, you get up and do what's asked for you each day. And I just appreciate you. And thanks for having me here. 
inspired soul you've made it all the way through to the end of another episode now on screen shortly will be a conversation with dr bruce lipton on how to reprogram your mind using epigenetics it's a really profound conversation and also a conversation about how to build a vivid vision for your life so on screen they'll pop up in just a moment but just before we go i want to say thank you so much for your subscription to the channel. To all of you that are subscribed to the channel, thank you so much. Everything you see that's being created here is thanks to your love and support. It's powered and empowered by your subscription. And to those of you that aren't subscribed to the channel, please do take a moment. It just takes a quick sec and a quick click. Um, hit subscribe, hit that bell notification. It really helps with everything we're doing here, championing positivity, wisdom, the love of wisdom around the world. Thank you so much in advance for your support. So on screen now, you'll see the opportunity to go further. Dr. Bruce Lips on how to reprogram your mind using epigenetics. If you see my face here, that's an opportunity for you to subscribe as well. Click on the icon. Um, and then also another couple of episodes for you to continue your journey to be inspired to evolve. Take your pick. I'll see you in the next one. Go on, click on one. I'll see you there.